Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this is episode 21 in the podcast series. I'm calling this one In the Grease, and I will explain that in just a minute. Uh, first things first, introductions and thank yous. Uh, you can find me just about everywhere as Knitting the Stash, on uh, Ravelry, on Instagram, on YouTube obviously, and on the blog, which is knittingthestash.wordpress.com. Uh, Thank you so much for coming over to spend some time with me this morning, or this afternoon, or this evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's always nice to have new folks here, so thanks for checking it out, and it's always great to have my, what I feel like my old friends, back. So thanks for coming back around for another episode. Uh, I love receiving comments and reading all of your posts in the Ravelry group. Uh, and getting little messages from you and I try to respond to everyone so please keep them coming it's the highlight of my day and uh, I love the little fiber community that we've built here so rad um, with that in mind I do want to put in a quick plug for the knit together project which we are in the midst of and the knit together project is going to go on for probably a year or more I've sent out DPNs to a bunch of folks and I have two more to give away at the end of this episode uh, and we've got people from all over the world just sending in squares for the Knit Together project. And you can check out all the details uh, over on the blog. People are making these little 8 by 8 inch blanket squares and if you send me a blanket square, you'll be entered to win one of the final blankets that I'll sew up. So go check it out, get involved, uh, it should be a fun project. On today's podcast, I have an FO, some brioche, not the bread, but the shawl variety. <laughs> Uh, I have sweater buttons at long last, woohoo! Uh, and I have some fun info about uh, yarn in the grease, and I will talk about that uh, yarn and a new sweater project uh, as we get along here. So let's jump in. Uh, I would normally do this in a different order, but it's hot. I'm wearing a very woolen <laughs> sweater that is actually in the grease as well. This is a uh, local Shetland wool that uh, not all of the lanolin was washed out of, so it is warm. And so I'm going to talk about this quickly first um, before I get to any other FOs. These are the Alias sweaters that you guys have seen in previous episodes. Alias is an Isabel Kramer pattern that I love. A wonderful, warm, cool cardigan. You can see, yeah, purple and pink. Uh, they did not have buttons for a very, very long time. And part of that reason for that is that I like to have yarn and buttons and stuffs that have little stories to them. So I didn't want to just pick out any buttons. I wanted buttons that um, would help me remember a place or think about something special. Um, and so uh, you guys know I was in New York for part of the summer and uh, in central New York, way far away from New York City. Um, but my son really wanted to go to New York City. He'd never been before. Uh, it turned into a little bit of a shopping trip for him, and I think he thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, for me, I just mostly knit and kind of followed him around the streets and brought him into little department stores, and we just had some fun uh, eating at little diners and things. Um, but I managed to sneak us over to the garment district on one of our walks and went to Mood. Oh my gosh, never been there. And let's see if you can see this on the... I should have brought the bag down. These are the little button bags I got. Uh, and so in Mood, Mood, which is like usually featured on Project Runway, and it's a funky store. There's, uh, I found out afterward, I, did, I hadn't put this all together, but uh, my son was like, look, there's a little dog running around the store, Mom. And it was Swatch the Bulldog. Uh, and they had beautiful fabrics, which I didn't even really get to look at all that much um, because I was obsessed with this massive wall of buttons. Uh, awesome. And so I found the buttons for both sweaters at Mood, and excuse the crinkling here, I'll open them up so you can see them. Uh, the idea was, <laughs> the problem was I didn't know exactly how many buttons I needed, and when you're inside Mood, you're, um, my phone wouldn't work so that I couldn't look anything up, so I just guesstimated it. I was like, I think it's about 10 or 11, so I bought 11 buttons hoping that they would work out, and it did. So. This is the first button. Let's see if we can get it to focus. You can see it actually better on my sweater. There you go. Um, they're like kind of really purpley, little paisley kind of pretty classic kind of buttons. And the other button is this guy. 
which you can't really see very well. So I'm just gonna bring the lady. Well, I'll put in, um, you know what? I'm just gonna put in a photo here because it'll be easier for you to see. Um, it's a kind of uh, light tanny gray kind of button that matches a little bit the um, lining of the sweater. Uh, and it has a little really adorable um, etching on it, which I really wish you could see. Maybe you can see it there. I never know with this camera. I think you can see it there. Uh, and so I got my buttons and I sewed them on and I'm psyched about that because now I have buttons. I think this sweater actually looks um, great buttoned up. Um, when I unbutton it, it looks a little funny because the buttons are, are so light compared to the dark fabric. This one I don't mind either way. So what are you gonna do? Uh, things I will say about sewing on buttons. <sighs> I am not a seamstress. I'm not a sewer of any kind. Uh, in fact, as I sit and sew on buttons, I think to myself, I need to decide that cardigans are not my favorite form of sweater because the buttons are always such a problem for me. Uh, anyway, I realized that uh, sewing is one of those things that I wish, like I want in my mind to be naturally good at it, you know, to like have some kind of acumen for it. Uh, but I'm just not willing to put in the hours, so I should just get over it and just accept that it's not something I do, maybe. Or maybe I should put in the hours. It's funny, because with knitting, I'll put in days, weeks, years of practice, and that's why I got good at it. With sewing, I'm like sewing on like three buttons a year, you know, I'm thinking to myself, God, why can't I do this better? Oh well. There are plenty of other wonderful people out there who have beautiful sewing blogs and podcasts and wonderful work. Um, like Maria of Stitched in Sweden, uh, and Tommy of the Squirrel Pie Productions podcast. So if you are looking for sewing, those are the, the gals to, to go to. Um, me, I'll do a few buttons <laughs> here and there. But these buttons have a story. They remind me of my trip to New York City with Zach. And I'm really happy that these sweaters are now closable, which makes all the difference. So, okay, I'm in a wardrobe change. See how that worked? That was pretty brilliant, right? Uh, of course, I'm wearing my old Crow Art Yarn uh, Freight Box t-shirt because it's so rad. So there you go, Camp Crystal Lake. It's funny because in my town there actually is a Crystal Lake. Uh, and so when I wear this around town, people are kind of like, is that Crystal Lake or like Crystal Lake? Like if they don't know the horror movie. So anyway, fun times. Okay, I have uh, an FO for you which is my Rebel 2 shawl, which I talked about last time. I had oodles and oodles of car knitting time, uh, and so here she is. Rebel 2, all finished. Washed, blocked, the whole deal. Uh, Rebel 2 is a pattern by Knit Graffiti, which is Leslie Ann Robinson. A really beautiful brioche pattern. I'll hold this part up to the camera a little bit here. You can see all the detail along the bottom. And you'll notice that this one, as you get to the edges, it kind of all merges together. All the brioche from above comes into the brioche from below, right? Uh, I think it's really beautiful. I'm not a big shawl wearer, but I know that in the winter time, <clears throat> I've found that having something around my neck is actually really kind of crazy warmer, warming. <clears throat> so. I will probably wear this underneath a coat and whatnot. Um, it's super warm because it's brioche, so it's like basically double-sided. Uh, and gosh, I never know how to wear these things. <laughs> so I just play around. I'm like, it's a cape. It's a shawl. I'm Superman. <laughs> okay, that's probably a little too much information. Uh, but it's really, it's very, you can see it's got a pretty big wing, wingspan. It's very warm. Uh, it has a nice drape to it. Um, I knit this out of Madeline Tosh uh, Twist, what is it, the Twist Light, the si basically the singles um, yarn. And the blue was a one-of-a-kind colorway that I got from uh, some kind of grab bag. And it was a little irregular in that sometimes it was really dark and sometimes it was a little lighter, but that was fine because it's kind of the background color for the shawl. The white was, um, I think it's called Antique Lace. Uh, and I was going to use these originally for a 
3-in-1 sweater. I had a bunch of different grays and blues put together for a 3-in-1 sweater uh, that I didn't end up making, so I've been kind of farming out the 3-in-1 um, yarn for a bunch of different shawls. So my Waiting for Rain shawl was also in this Madeline Tosh Merino Light, uh, and this one is Madeline Tosh uh, Merino Light, the singles. And one other thing to note about this shawl, which you may not notice unless I point it out, is that because this lighter gray color was one that I used for my Waiting for Rain shawl, it took a little bit more than a full skein of yarn. And so I had to crack into another skein of yarn, which then turned into the skein of yarn I used for this, which means I didn't have a full skein of yarn. Uh, and so I had to finish off with a different color way, totally different color way. Uh, and so this one on the bottom, maybe you can see it. This last little repeat here is in a slightly different color. And I'm going to go pull out the little tag so that I can tell you what that color was. Hang on. Uh, Astrid Gray, which Madeline Tosh, Astrid Gray. This is the Tosh Merino Light tag. Um, and so I was a little bit worried that using a different colorway would be kind of funny, but uh, it worked out because the it almost looks a little faded toward the bottom, a little more white and a little less gray, and I think that's okay. So it worked out quite well, and I will put it up on uh, my lovely assistant here who can wear it for a moment. Uh, I think Knit Graffiti's patterns are really cool. She does some, I talked about this last time, she does some really great um, uh, design work where her patterns just kind of float and sit on top of this beautiful brioche kind of background. And this is no exception. Um, I want to check out her patterns a little bit more um, and maybe knit another one. This shawl totally changed with blocking is the other thing I would mention. Uh, so of course, as usual, the advice is block your knits. Totally true. The shawl, when I finished it, was kind of like a crumpled up ball. Uh, and the minute I put it in the water and then laid it out and I blocked it so that these guys would drop down uh, and kind of be little points, uh, made all the difference. So totally go for that kind of thing. All right, that is my finished object for the week. And that and the buttoned up sweaters. So what next? I'm going to tell you about why this episode is called In the Grease. So last night as I was uh, finishing sewing on the buttons and kind of looking around Ravelry for something new to get involved in, because I actually have only one thing on my needles at this point, which is a pair of knee socks that have <laughs> been in desperate need of finishing for the last six months, you know, and I will finish them first. Um, but I was kind of poking around Ravelry thinking like, what's next? What really catching my eye? I like to find funky patterns and um, things that'll teach me something and did brioche this year, color work, a lot of texture with cables and lace. So I was kind of poking around and my husband was like, you know, you could, I, winter's upon us and I'd love to have a sweater, uh, another one, because I've knit him lots of socks and one other sweater in um, hemp, a hemp sweater, which was really cool. Uh, and kind of distressed looking and, and kind of funky. Uh, and I, I know he really wants a fisherman sweater. So a fisherman sweater with like lots and lots of cables, uh, you know, kind of old school, a little bit looking. Um, and it's kind of funny because he's a very hot blooded individual. Like he's very warm all the time. So I'm not, re I've never been convinced that he needs a wool sweater. Uh, but I think he would wear it when it gets really cold, especially out in New York, if we're out there for Christmas break or something like that. Um, or if he's working out here in the wind, uh, he might throw on a sweater as one of his outer layers. So he wanted to get some yarn. He wanted me to make him a sweater. I'm happy to do it because I love knitting sweaters. Uh, and he said, what I'd really love is a sweater like your purple sweater that I just had on that has the lanolin in it, you know, like a true fisherman sweater. Um, and so that's why this episode is called In the Grease, because I'm talking about yarns that have lanolin in them. I did a quick search, and it turns out there are a bunch of yarn companies, especially um, Norwegian yarn companies, that uh, produce yarn with the lanolin in it, or they add the lan lanolin back in. Um, there is a U.S. option, um, Bartlett Yarns uh, out of Maine, 
The Rice family, they do uh, a yarn that has the lanolin on the left end. So there is a US option. But most of the um, yarns that I found were Norwegian um, of one kind or another. Uh, the one that I picked, I was down to two. One was the Dale Garn uh, Natural Lanolin Wool. Uh, and that one, they add the lanolin in post dyeing. So they kind of strip the lanolin out because you have to do that if you're going to dye something. Um, if you leave lanolin in, dyes won't strike in the right kinds of ways on the fiber. So you take all the lanolin out, uh, you really scour your wool, then you can dye it, and then they add the lanolin back in. I'm not exactly sure how that works. Um, Anna of the Dunkelgrund podcast, I think Anna is a chemist, and Anna, if you have any insights on how you could add lanolin back into wool, I would love to hear about it on your podcast. Uh, I haven't quite done the research yet to figure that out, so it's a mystery to me, but that's how the Dale Garn Natural Lanolin Wool Company does it. The yarn that I settled on is a uh, Siri yarn, which uh, it comes out of the Faroe Islands, and it is one of three different uh, companies of yarn or brands of yarn that come out of the Faroe Island um, wool. Uh, Siri is run by Arnie and uh, Karen, and they live in the Faroe Islands, and they, I think they, along with the uh, Navia, ship their yarn, their fleece, to the wool, to uh, Lithuania where it's processed. The other uh, of the three yarn options from the Faroe Islands, there's Siri, there's Navia, and then there's Snadlin, and I'm probably really butchering that, I'm sorry. Um, but the Snadlin yarn is um, made on site in one of the mills, the only mill that's left on the Faroe Islands. They started and opened it in 1949, and they're still producing wool. So if you go to the Faroe Islands, I guess you can check out this mill where they're still using the mostly the wool from the islands and producing the wool on site on the islands. Um, their wool is a blend of Faroe sheep and Falkland Island sheep, um, which sounds awesome because Falkland sheep is uh, mostly merino, so it would be a very soft kind of blend. Um, so Faroe Island sheep are kind of related, they're, they're part of the Gute sheep family, I suppose. That's as far as I've been able to figure out. And Rachel of the Treehouse Knits podcast will, she's been doing breed studies, so is Rachel of Smith of uh, Welford Pearls uh, and the Wool and Spinning blog, blog pod, <laughs> blog past, podcast. Rachel of the Wool and Spinning podcast. They both focused a lot on breeds in the last year. Um, so you guys, if you know more about the Gooch sheep family, love to hear about it. Uh, what I've been able to find out so far is that Faroe uh, sheep are kind of related to Icelandic and Shetland sheep in that they're sort of primitive. Um, and like Icelandic sheep, Faroe sheep have both the kind of tell and tog, like the long, kind of more coarse wool, and then the short downy fiber. And some of the yarns, the Siri, Navia, or Snelden, uh, will pull out the kemp and take out the coarse fibers and just use the downy fibers. Um, the yarn that I chose, which is the Siri yarn, uh, which is 100% organic, 100% Faroe Island, uh, they just blend it all together. So as you kind of knit, I've read some reviews, and you kind of pull out a little bit of Kemp here and there, you pull out a little bit of hay, or whatever it is. I love knitting with yarns like that, you guys know that. Um, so I chose the Siri yarn, uh, and I'm really excited to knit with a breed-specific yarn that's 100% Faroe sheep. The Faroe sheep are a really cool, um, breed of sheep living out on these islands, like up, and, and the Faroe Islands, for anyone who doesn't know, I wish I had a little map here, maybe I'll put one in. Uh, the Faroe Islands are kind of like, uh, I'm going to get my directions wrong, they're east of Iceland, north of Scotland, and kind of west of Finland. Did I get that right? I think I got that right. So they're right up there in the North Atlantic, very cold, very windy, um, and these sheep uh, pretty much roam around the islands. I guess there's um, twice as many sheep as people out there. And from what I can gather, the farmers don't really keep uh, sheep in on private property. It's not like they're you know separate flocks. It's like the sheep just kind of like hang out, and then the folks on the islands gather together for lambing season, for shearing, uh, and 
it just seems like a really cool community kind of event. And Sarah Fibertrek has been out on the Orkney Islands and talked a little bit about um, her experiences there. So you can check out her podcast for more place-based Orkney Island sheepy goodness. Um, but I'm fascinated about these, these Pharaoh sheep and I'm really looking forward to knitting Spencer's sweater out of this 100% organic lanolin in the grease wool. Uh, and for the Siri version of the yarn, I think they can leave the uh, lanolin in because it's all naturally dyed, so it's not, um, they're not doing acid dyes where you'd need the lanolin to be out. And the yarn that I picked for him, he loves grays. Um, the yarn that he picked out actually is a medium gray, and I think it's just a natural gray from the sheep themselves. Uh, I guess the pharaoh sheep are split 30-30-30, um, black, white, and gray. There's a little bit of brown in there every once in a while, but mostly it's those three primer, prime, prime, <laughs> they're not primary colors, those three colors, black, white, and gray. So to get a medium gray yarn means that uh, that's in the lanolin, in the grease, um, it's just a natural, it's just natural wool. So it'll be great to knit the sweater for him. And the sweater that he, I had him kind of look around um, for some sweaters. And he picked out one that I thought was nice. He's really into these cables, like all over cables. Um, he picked out one that I thought was okay. And I, I just said it looked a little dated. And I found instead um, that Nora Gon has a beautiful pattern called Denali which pretty much covers what he, let's see if we're gonna get the screen to work here, pretty much covers what his requests were, that it be an all over cable. Let me see if I can get this better. There we go. Maybe you can see that a little better. Yeah. Uh, so it's an all over cable that the back looks just like the front. And I think it'll be a really cool pattern to knit. It has, uh, Nora Gon, um, just recently published the um, Cable Source book, which I talked about on a previous episode. And so she's kind of like one of the masters of cable knitting. And she's integrated some really interesting couple different cables into the sweater that I'm excited to knit. Uh, it is a sweater that is knit in pieces and then seamed afterward. So you knit the front, the back, and the two sleeves, saddle shoulders, uh, and then you seam everything together. Um, I think this first time through, I'm all about modifying patterns, but this first time through I'm going to follow her pattern pretty well. I know, or pretty closely, I know that Spencer would like to have um, some kind of cable going down the sleeve, so I may try to add that in, um, because right now the sweater just has the cable going on the front and on the back and nothing on the sleeves. So I'll probably add in some kind of cable work down the sleeve, um, which would be pretty simple because everything, like I said, is knit flat. And uh, with saddle shoulders, uh, it'll run flat here and then just straight down. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem to add a cable and I'll just have to check my gauge. So that'll be the next sweater that I have on the needles. Um, pretty kind of long term probably for Spencer as we go toward winter. Uh, I love that it's going to be in the grease. I love that it involves um, this 100% Faroe Island sheep wool. And in doing some research, I also found out, since this episode is called In the Grease, uh, I found out that there's a wool wash that actually can add lanolin back into your wool, woolens, which I think is great. It's kind of like adding enamel back to your teeth or something. <laughs> um, so it's this product um, called uh, Sonnet Ulker, I think. I'm butchering all these names today. I'm really sorry. Um, but here's a quick photo of the product. And I will put links to everything in the show notes. Um, but apparently there's this wool wash that'll add lanolin back into your stuff if you are missing lanolin. Or, you know, if you have a lanolin rich sweater that, you know, as you wash it, the lanolin will come out over time, depending on the heat of your water. Uh, you could use this wash that adds it back in. So you can not only knit in the grease, <laughs> but you can wash in the grease too. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't note that uh, the la I've mentioned a couple different yarn companies where you can get wool and yarn in the grease. Um, the Dale Garn uh, Natural Lanolin Wool, the uh, Siri Wool that I'm going to use, uh, Bartlett Yarns uh, in the U.S. But the other option is to just spin it yourself in the grease, which a lot of spinners do. Spinning in the grease is actually really great because uh, it, the fibers hold together really nicely. It's a really pleasant experience on your hands. Uh, it's like 
spinning with hand lotion, <laughs> natural hand lotion. Uh, so you could spin a sweaters with of yarn, and I know folks have done that, and that is a great way to have uh, an entire sweater that's in the grease. Um, yeah. Um, by the way, if you're interested in checking out the Siri yarn, the Navia yarn, or the Snedlen yarn that I mentioned, um, these are all from the Faroe Islands. Uh, you can go to Island Yarn Company, which is run by Fiona Parker. She started it in 2012, and she has a lot of really great options for those three different yarns, all kinds of different weights um, from lace weight all the way down to a bulky for most of them. Uh, so if you're interested in getting your own Faroe sheep yarn, check out her shop and I'll put a link in the notes for today. Okay, so in the grease will be Spencer sweater uh, made of Faroe Island uh, wool and yarn and for me what's next? Well, I've been looking around Ravelry and I have a few favorites in mind, but one pattern that I just found last night that I hadn't seen before uh, is Nitya by Nidhi uh, Kansal, and I happened to stumble upon it. Okay, it's a beautiful cardigan that has some contrasting details, some piping kind of along the um, button band, the collar, the sleeves. And I think it's just, it's like a really nice contrast, the piping with the ribbing. Uh, fingering weight yarn. I know, am I gonna make another fingering weight sweater? I think I am, <laughs> because I really like this one. Uh, and Nitty was so sweet, I commented on her, when I found her beautiful pattern, I commented, and she sent me a copy of it. Um, so thank you, Nitty. Uh, and I'm gonna have a look at the pattern, see if I can source some yarn, and I think that might be my next sweater. Maybe, another fingering weight sweater. Could be. Uh, so thank you, Nitty, for sending along the pattern. I can't wait to check it out more. Hmm, what's left? The giveaway! <laughs> so, so I mentioned um, in the beginning that we have this Knit Together project, and I want to give away a couple more sets of DPNs to get more people involved. So I asked you to comment on the last episode if um, you're interested in getting some DPNs from me. And the winners of the random draw were Leslie, uh, who is Busilova, Bukalova? I'm sorry if I'm butchering that too. Um, Bukalova on Ravelry, and the second winner is Maureen Lehman. Uh, so Leslie and Maureen, I will ping you in the comments on YouTube and catch you on Ravelry if I can. You can send me your uh, addresses and I will get those needles in the mail to you. So I think that's about it for today. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining me to talk about yarn and wool in the grease, to see the new buttons, to see the brioche. There's so much goodness going on uh, and I'd love to hear from y'all. Good luck with your um, blanket squares. I can't wait to see them. I can't wait to open the mailbox and see the first squares roll in. Uh, so get over there, check out the Nintendo Other Project and come join us. As always, I hope you have some fun out there and some knitting adventures until I see you next time. Bye.